Okay, so we're done with our discussion of laws of mechanics now, or basic mechanical principles. We're going to start on a much shorter section on basic thermodynamical principles. <clears throat> Only occupies about 20 pages of the textbook, so going to be relatively short. <clears throat> and a lot of it is really just restating what we're going to do in this lecture um, in different ways. Namely, like we'll do it for a spatial region convecting with the body, and then they kind of redo it for spatial control volumes and referential form and things like that. All right, so we're going to talk about two laws of thermodynamics, the first law and the second law. Um, the first law of thermodynamics is balance of energy, and that one is, you know, pretty well <clears throat> agreed upon for what it is. Um, you'll see a million different second laws of thermodynamics that all sort of express the same idea, um, namely that there is loss in any process. And that would be, in this, we're talking about non-negative production of entropy. There's a bunch of other numbered laws of thermodynamics out there. Um, <clears throat> no one ever really talks about them, and neither will we. And the textbook doesn't. So first, let's get on to balance of energy. We sort of already did most of it, apart from the thermal part. We did balance of mechanical energy in the generalized external power balance, <clears throat> and that internal power is kind of what typically that goes from mechanical power into thermal power. So all that we need to do is add <clears throat> thermal effects to the mechanical energy equation that we already had, and that'll give us balance of energy. All right, so in addition to mass and momentum, we postulate that energy is a conserved quantity. Um, this is based on, <clears throat> you know, our observation of reality. So it's uh, not something that can be proved or disproved. It just really seems to be true. We haven't really found any counterexample, although, you know, there could be questions to the existential nature of what it means for something to be mass, momentum, or energy. But to, to our understanding of what they are, it's true. So we're going to postulate it, come up with a mathematical definition of it, and then come up with laws based on the con or rather come up with theorems based on the consequences of that. So for a spatial region, P sub T, convecting with the body again, Energy balance is a balance between the rate of change of internal energy, so like internal thermal energy, and rate of change of kinetic energy with external work applied and external heat added. So we can write that out like this. So we have this E, which is going to be the internal energy of the region, <clears throat> plus the kinetic energy of the region, the time rate of change of that sum is equal to <clears throat> the conventional external power, which we already know about. and then plus the heat flux, heat flow into 
the body. So we, we remember from before that the conventional external power minus the time rate of change of kinetic energy, that would be the generalized external power, and it's equal to the internal power. And we haven't written the internal power here, um, but we'll get there in a little bit. All right, so here, E of PT is the net internal energy. <clears throat> so if you're talking about, say, a perfect gas, that might be CV times the temperature. We'll get there later on. Uh, K. the kinetic energy so we already gave an expression for that but we'll write it out k pt is defined as the integral over p of one half rho magnitude of v squared dv W naught, the conventional external power. So that's the integral <clears throat> over the boundary of the stress traction dot the velocity dA plus the integral over the region of the conventional body force dot the velocity dv so the work done by the conventional body force and q Pt, the net heat flow. Into, the into there is going to be important because it's going to make a weird sign happen on the heat flux vector, which we'll talk about in a bit. All right, so we're going to define this quantity called the specific <clears throat> internal energy epsilon and uh you know that would be your like cv times t sort of thing for a gas all right so defining So the net internal energy is equal to the integral over the body of the density times the specific internal energy over the volume. So specific means per unit mass <clears throat> is the take home point there. All right. So in that case, E dot PT is equal to PT rho little e dot dV as a consequence of mass balance from before, uh, since this is a region convecting with the body. All right, so we're going to assume that the heat flow is due to a vector surface heat flux Q and a scalar volumetric heat source, also Q, but not vector.
All right, so the heat flux vector, um, <clears throat> you can prove that it has to be a vector if you say that it takes directions and gives you the scalar heat flux in that direction using the exact same logic that we used to prove Cauchy's theorem for the stress tensor. Um, might make that a homework problem. It's pretty easy. It was one of the final exam problems when I took the class years ago. All right. <clears throat> so we have Q of P T is equal to minus the integral over the boundary of Q dot N dA plus P sub T Q dV. And so it's this minus here that I was talking about. Um, because N is the outward normal, this is the flow of heat out of <clears throat> the region P sub T. But we had defined Q to be the net heat flow into it. So that's where the negative sign comes from. All right, so from that, we can get the integral form of the balance of energy. So we have, yeah, we can fit that all on this page if we're clever about it. <clears throat> ah, Freaking technology. Just, there you go. <clears throat> all right, we got the integral over the body, well, over the region of rho e plus one half magnitude of V squared we'll put a little material time derivative over that oh no we're not going to do that I'm getting ahead of myself there I'm going to put it over the whole thing so that's over the integral and we'll be able to <coughs> move that to just the second quantity in it in a second because of the balance of mass. That is equal to the minus integral over the boundary of Q dot N dA plus Q dV. So that's kind of your heat flow, your thermal energy. And then we also have plus the mechanical energy being delivered, so that would be T N dot V <clears throat> dA plus B naught dot V dV. As so we're saying that the time rate of change of the sum of the thermal and mechanical, if we talk about kinetic as the mechanical <clears throat> energy of it. So we're not talking about strain energy yet, that's later. Um, so at any rate, the time rate of change of the total energy of the material contained in this spatially, well, this spatial region convecting with the body, it's equal to the net flow in of thermal energy plus the net rate of work done on that region. And that makes sense. All right, well, we can go make this whole thing a volume integral by using the divergence theorem. And when we do that, I'm also going to make it so that this is just the material time derivative of this, um, which is a consequence of the balance of mass. So what we have is now the integral over this spatial region convecting with the body of square brace rho 
E plus one half magnitude V squared material time derivative of that mess <coughs> plus I forgot an important little thing there the divergence of Q minus Q minus the div of T transpose V minus B naught dot V dv is equal to zero. Put that missing div into my notes here. All right, so now we're going to recall the um, generalized external power balance. So that is the integral over the boundary of t n dot v dA plus the integral over the region of b naught dot v dV is equal to the integral over the region of t inner product d dV. Well, then we have that the integral <clears throat> we'll apply the divergence theorem to this term of div t transpose v plus b naught dot v oops that's not a b naught right there that is the generalized body force so that includes the inertial term and then minus one half <coughs> rho v squared time derivative of that dv move that over out of the way is equal to the integral over P sub T of T inner product D dV. All right, well, we can substitute that <clears throat> into this. And what we end up with is going to be shorter. And the textbook is going to end up calling this local energy balance. Um, in fluids, you'll often hear it called the thermal energy equation. So we have that the integral over that region of rho time derivative of internal energy following the material T inner product D, the internal energy div q minus q dv is equal to zero all right and so that applies to any arbitrary region p sub t convecting with the body so we can apply the localization theorem and get that rho e dot <clears throat> is equal to t inner product d minus div q plus q. So that's saying that the time rate of change of the local internal energy density is equal to this here, which is the <clears throat> internal work i believe we called it in the generalized external power balance but it's basically the rate at which mechanical energy is converted to thermal energy so things like your frictional losses becoming heat and then minus the divergence of the heat flux vector so this is the heat flux into that point from outside and then plus the local 
heat source. So this is the local energy balance. AKA thermal energy equation. All right, so that was it for <clears throat> the like little two page chapter on the first law of thermodynamics, the balance of energy. There was another couple page chapter on non-negative production of entropy, which is the second law of thermodynamics. Although, as uh, Clifford Truesdell points out, there are a whole bunch of takes on what the second law of thermodynamics is. Uh, he wrote a interesting book, not necessarily incorrect, although I think it's got a little bit of arrogance to him, but it doesn't mean that his stuff is not good to read, um, called The Tragicomical History of Thermodynamics. <clears throat> Gives you a little historical perspective on it. Um, I think he's not quite fair to the people who came before him in that, you know, everything's clear to him because he's kind of building on the shoulders of everyone before. And, you know, they didn't have all of the differential geometry and stuff to build their perspective on. So he's only able to see things with this sort of clarity based on the principle of virtual work and all that, um, really because other people had spent centuries kind of pondering it before he had time to come in and look at it that way. But still a pretty cool read. All right, so anyway, let's get on to the second law of thermodynamics. <clears throat> Well, I guess before we do that gives me one other thing, observation about uh, your careers and life to make. So, you know, there's, there's some people out there, evidently based on what I've seen written about him, probably applies to Clifford Truesdell, where if you're good enough, you can get away with being a bit of an a-hole and still have a good career. But, um, you know, that doesn't mean that you have to. Even if you're that good, you'd be better off treating people well and not being arrogant because it'll take you a lot further. So strive to be, you know, someone who's good enough that you could, but then don't be an a-hole. All right, so the second law, non-negative production of entropy. So the second law of thermodynamics basically guarantees that useful energy is lost to heat that kind of gets uniformly dissipated in any real process. So the entropy, which is sort of, it's the disorder in a system, but it also gives you an idea of the inavailability of energy to do work. And so what we mean by that is if you have two blobs of stuff, and this one is at temperature one, Ooh, let's make it, we don't like to use T for temperature in this, we use theta one for absolute temperature and theta two. Um, I suppose it's because they used capital T for <coughs> the Cauchy stress and really didn't want to do it. At any rate, if those are at two different absolute temperatures, um, we can you know, extract mechanical power from it by essentially like a Rankine cycle or you know, any, any sort of heat engine. Um, and so what the second law says is that no matter what you do, 
this heat's going to eventually kind of diffuse out through the boundary if, say, this one's hotter. Then the whole thing's going to eventually come to some uniform temperature. And once you have something that's uniform temperature everywhere, you can't really do anything with it. You can't, like, cause heat to spontaneously flux and do something. And so that's really what it's saying. And then mechanical processes are always going to have losses to heat as well. <clears throat> All right, so let's define S of P sub T, the net internal entropy contained within that region. Let's define J, and again, the text makes these scripty ones. I can't draw <clears throat> a scripty non-cursive S or J to save my life. The entropy flow. Call it rate <clears throat> into P sub T and letting H. See, I can make a scripty H. That's pretty cool. So we're going to define this one as being the difference between the time rate of change of the entropy contained in that region minus the net flux in. So H is then the net entropy production in P, right? It's, um, if it's positive, it's saying that the entropy of that region is increasing faster than entropy is fluxing into it. <clears throat> now we haven't really given a you know, formal definition of what entropy is, and there's a bunch of things that are all equivalent. Um, but what we are going to do is we're going to give a definition of absolute temperature in terms of entropy flux, and um, we'll be able to make all of our thermodynamic laws without needing to have a really weird statistical thermodynamical discussion of entropy or seeing how that uh, is congruent with other definitions of it. Um, so this is going to be one of those quantities, which I suppose energy and momentum are all the same way, except that they're more familiar where it's like, you kind of know what it is, but like, if you had to put it into exact words, I suppose that momentum and energy are about the same way. You take them as things that exist and write balance laws for them, but beyond that, yeah, so entropy is just an intrinsic thing. All right, so this is the net entropy production. Then the second law of thermodynamics can be stated pretty simply. As H P T is greater than or equal to zero for all those convecting with the body. So 
So another way of saying it <clears throat> would be that the time rate of change of the entropy is greater than or equal to the entropy flux into it. Like we did with specific internal energy, we will do the same with specific internal entropy. So this is entropy per unit mass. <clears throat> some eta, <clears throat> so S, PD is equal to the integral over that region of rho, eta, over the volume. And similar to the heat flux, we're going to assume that the entropy flux is in terms of a vector field defining the surface flux and a scalar field defining the volumetric source. I suppose that's similar to heat flow, not flux. So we have that J of that region is equal to minus an integral over the boundary of a vector J dot N dA plus the integral there of J dV. Then we can express the second law as the integral body of rho eta dv time derivative of the whole shebang is greater than or equal to negative boundary integral of j dot n dA plus integral over the volume of j dv. <coughs> So a fundamental assumption of continuum thermodynamics is that there is a scalar field theta, in LaTeX it would be var theta, uh, called the absolute temperature that relates entropy flux to heat flux and entropy source to heat source. So we have that the entropy flux is equal to the heat flux divided by the absolute temperature and the entropy volumetric source is equal to the heat source divided by the absolute temperature. So in other words, this is kind of why it's difficult to make things really cold because you know making entropy tends to increase the absolute temperature of things um, and so if there's any heat flux at all then you're going to have a lot of entropy increase you know when you're at low temperature all right so another consequence of this is that <clears throat> heat and entropy flow in the same direction, really this one, and um, heat flux and entropy flux cannot vanish individually without the other one vanishing. So you can't have heat flux without moving entropy around. All right, so we can now, from this, 
make the Clausius Duhem inequality. So all that we're doing is going to substitute those expressions for j vector and j scalar into our integral form of the second law. So we have that the integral over the region, rho a to dv, time derivative of the whole mess, is greater than or equal to, hopefully I remembered that the last time, yep, <clears throat> uh, minus the boundary integral of q vector over the absolute temperature dot n dA plus the integral over the volume of the scalar heat source divided by the absolute temperature. Remember when you're doing this, uh, it is the absolute temperature, so like Rankine's or Kelvin and not Fahrenheit or Celsius. All right, well, we can rewrite the left-hand side as, um, nope, not that one. Rho, eta dot. All right, so, ooh, we can use some science and technology here. No, no. Telling you, every time I try to use this thing to do something cool, makes me regret it. All right, well, we can um, apply the divergence theorem and the localization theorem to get rho <clears throat> eta dot is greater than or equal to minus div q vector over theta, Ugh. get rid of that there, and then plus the scalar q over theta. <clears throat> Let's define the entropy production density gamma, so this is per unit volume, not per unit mass. Otherwise, we would call it the specific entropy production. <clears throat> so that would be basically move all that crap to the left-hand side in the above. Then the local form of the second law is just that gamma is greater than or equal to zero. For all space and for all time. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to um, do a little bit of <clears throat> a little bit of calculus here. So let's look at minus div q. Boy, I cannot get that right, you know. over theta plus <clears throat> q over theta. So we're basically just going to use the, um, oh, product rule, I guess we'll call it, for that divergence there. I guess it's the quotient rule, but that's a form of the product rule. All right, so that is equal to 1 over theta 
minus div q plus q plus 1 over theta squared q dot grad theta. <coughs> All right, well, we can factor a theta out of the whole thing, and we get that that is equal to 1 over theta. We're going to use our first law of thermodynamics, um, specifically the local balance of energy or the thermal energy equation, which related rho e dot to uh, t inner product d and some heat flux stuff and we get rho times the time derivative of the specific internal energy minus the internal power <coughs> plus one over theta times the heat flux inner product temperature gradient with the second step uh, coming from the first law of thermodynamics. <clears throat> All right, well, we can plug that into the second law of thermodynamics. We get that rho times the time derivative of the internal, the specific internal energy minus theta, the temperature, times the material time derivative of the specific entropy minus the internal power plus one over the absolute temperature heat flux dot temperature gradient is equal to the temperature times the entropy production density. Oopsies, that's a net minus there. Let's move that all over. And so, because the temperature is strictly positive, um, that all has to be less than or equal to zero since gamma is strictly greater than or equal to zero. Now let's define the specific free energy, which would be the internal energy that you can use for work. So the temperature times the entropy density sort of represents the portion of that that is not useful for doing work. So psi is defined as E minus theta eta. Then we get the local free energy imbalance. <coughs> which is that rho times the time derivative of the free energy plus the entropy times the material time derivative of temperature minus the internal power plus q dot. Move that over a little bit. All right, that is equal to minus theta gamma, which is less than or equal to zero. <clears throat> All 
All right, so if we kind of do the backwards localization theorem, or rather we integrate it over a body and substitute in balance, generalized balance of external power and make some things boundary integrals, we get this. So doing calculus and also substituting in the generalized balance of external power, then we get that the integral over the region of the temperature times the specific entropy production is equal to the integral over the boundary T n dot V dA plus the integral over the volume of the conventional, so not <clears throat> inertial term, body force dV. So this would be And then minus the integral over the volume of rho free energy plus, well, specific free energy plus 1 half V squared specific kinetic energy dV, the time derivative of that. So it would be free and kinetic energy rates and then minus the integral over the volume of rho specific entropy time derivative of temperature plus one over temperature Q dot grad V <coughs> dV. This one is the thermal production of energy. I feel like I must have missed a uh, Q in there, did I? All right, so that is what the dissipation is equal to. And the dissipation, all right, so this one here is called the dissipation. And so it's saying that, you know, this whole thing is greater than or equal to zero. So the right-hand side is greater than or equal to zero. So what we have is that the conventional external power that's positive, so the rate of work that's being done is you know, greater than or equal to the amount that you're increasing the free and kinetic energy minus the thermal production of energy. <coughs> Which is to say that there's, you know, some, some loss to entropy, basically. Um, that you are going to somewhere along the way lose useful power and end up with entropy. Well, use, lose useful energy and end up with entropy. All right, that's, um, that's about all that I got for here. Let's look at the next chapter here, decide whether we're going to do a lecture on it. I might just do a little 
So they had a couple useful things in the next chapter, um, but I don't know that it's neat enough to do a full lecture on. So we're going to have a look right now. <coughs> so it'll be chapter 28. Um, yeah, so I think you should just read chapter 28. Really, the first page and a half is useful because basically what it says is that the internal energy and the entropy, the specific internal energy and the specific internal entropy, so little e or little epsilon and little nu, um, those are not really to be understood in an absolute sense. You know, you could pick any arbitrary reference value, and it's really differences in those that matter, sort of like gauge pressure, um, you know. And then also that the heat flux, um, the only part of the heat flux that matters is the part of it that is aligned with the temperature gradient, um, which is why we always consider it aligned with the temperature gradient. Yes, yeah, so I'd say just look through chapter 28, read it, try to understand it. And next lecture we'll hit maybe chapter 29 and uh, 30 real quick. And yeah, we won't spend too long on this thermodynamic section. Probably got another two maybe three lectures after this one. Not gonna be like full hour and a half ones. All right, I'm gonna get you folks a, a fifth homework assignment posted like later today or tomorrow. Um, try to make it pretty short, pretty straightforward. Shooting to have that one due uh, late this week or sometime next weekend. And then we'll start on the constitutive theory stuff and I'll make like a, a super duper short one or two problem homework due sometime during finals week there. Hope that's all right with all of you. I know in grad school, you don't really have too many classes. Um, so I'm not really too worried about a small homework assignment or even a moderate one getting in the way of your studying for other finals. Um, if it is a major hardship for you for some reason, let me know and we'll work something out, but I expect it'll be all right. Okay, have a good one. We'll catch you later on.